of the things I like the best about uh, Guitar Center is it was uh, like you obviously got to sell, but it was the one job that I felt like uh, it was less about you like making the boss money and and more about you being an employee uh and being a person and they actually care for you as a person uh and so i worked there twice uh i'm not ashamed to say on both of my last days even though i was moving on to better jobs and i wanted something different uh i i like cried like a baby on my last days there uh because it was just sad to leave you know it's you're leaving like even though it doesn't pay well and you're not going to be like, uh, you can't do this for your entire life unless you're like a really good salesman or you move up into management. Um, you know that you're leaving like one of the more fun jobs that you'll ever have. Cause like after this, it's like, okay, let's get to work. Or you got a boss that doesn't really care about you. Uh, and so, yeah, I was, I was really sad to leave guitar center. Um, one of the coolest things about it every year, they had a Christmas party. And they would rent out the Granada Theater in Dallas, which is off of Greenville. Um, it's like a, it's like an old theater, but now they do like musical performances there. And they would have a battle of the bands between uh, all the different stores in the DFW Metroplex. So every store would like put together a band, and it have to be like a cover band. Um, so you pick you pick some sort of music or or a specific band. Um, and everybody practices the songs. Uh, and it was just so over the top. Like everybody would dress up. They would do these like crazy characters of, of the bands that they were covering. Uh, like I think one of the years our store did like Aerosmith. Uh, and the guy was like wearing the crazy clothes. Like uh, who's the Aerosmith guy? Yes, like Steven Tyler. And he had all the like bandanas tied onto his mic stand. Uh, it was, it was just like so much fun for a Christmas party um, where normally like nothing against Palmer. I love Palmer, um, but like we have like a Christmas potluck um, and it's just like going to a battle of the bands is way above like a Christmas potluck. Um, and even with like a Christmas potluck, that's more than like most of the jobs that I've ever had. Uh, if you're lucky, they give you like a ham or something for Christmas uh, and, a, and a turkey for Thanksgiving. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I really like guitar singer. Appreciate, even if you know it's not like the job that you want, uh, try to find things to appreciate in all of your jobs and, and you'll be a lot happier for it. Because one of the things I've learned is once you leave high school, I mean, not that there's not miserable people in high school. Um, once you leave high school and get into your real jobs, uh, you meet a lot of miserable people that are just, they don't like what they're doing. Uh, they don't like where they're at in life and they're just not very happy. And if you concentrate on that, you won't be happy. Um, but even in like jobs that aren't great, uh, like I, when I got out of OU, I worked at Subway for a while. Um, and I didn't like it at all, but you know, I, I found things to take pride in, even as a sandwich artist at Subway, uh, making like seven something an hour. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I had to convince myself that there was something good that I was doing there. Uh, and I knew it was only like a temporary thing, but uh, even knowing it's temporary, if you can't find something that you like about a job, uh, you're not gonna be happy outside the job. And that's, that's something I always try to do is just uh, make sure I'm keeping my eye on the prize and know that my time at work is is not the reason that I work. Uh, it's it's my time away from home, my time that I get to play video games or like uh, I hate working on my house, but I like working on my house because I get that like pride of ownership thing. No, uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm excited about my wife getting this new position because I think we'll we'll have uh, a little bit of extra cash to be able to go on vacations and stuff. Oh, it's not working again. Although she's going to be, uh, now she's like literally in a much more vital position. So before we could, like she would take off the last week of summer break and we'd spend the last week of summer break together and she take off Christmas break and all this other stuff. <clears throat> there it goes. So, is it not gonna work? Uh, 
And now she's like an extremely vital position. And so her ability to take off her vacations is going to be very limited. Uh, in fact, sorry that I paused the video. I don't want to blast all my personal stuff all over the internet. Uh, yesterday I had to remove comments from one of my YouTube. I think it was the video I made in this class. Uh, I recorded it and posted it. And within a couple minutes, I had an email that said, somebody made a comment on your video. Uh, and luckily I looked at it and it's some like creeper posting this really like inappropriate, creepy comment with a link to it. Um, like it's, it obviously just posted on YouTube as one of the newest videos. And I guess they were just scanning the brand newest videos. Um, and yeah, posted some uh, weird inappropriate link probably to a, a, a viral website uh, and I'll see now. So yeah, I had to delete that and now I have my uh, channel set where there are no comments on all the new videos. So, um, or I guess you can make comments, but I have to verify them and allow them first. So uh, hopefully that cuts back on that. Uh, I feel bad if anybody, first off, don't click on links in YouTube comments. Uh, <laughs> Second off, probably unless you're on like a nice video, uh, YouTube comments are pretty toxic anyway, so I wouldn't even scroll down and, and view those. But uh, why are we starting in the middle here? Hold on. I'm sorry. Today's just a lax day. We are we did a lot this week. Uh, Y'all got a lab done. Remember that the homeworks are out. Come on. In show. Slideshow. Setup slideshow. Let's enable editing here. Uh, yes, enable editing. Come on, there we go. And now let's save this. Um, file off to the side. Save. Nice. Now my controls. Yes. Okay. Um, and let's go all the way back to the beginning. I don't know why it didn't start at the beginning. So today, we're going to start a little bit into plate tectonics. Uh, this is not as long as I thought it was. It's only 50-something slides, so we should be able to finish this uh, midweek next week. And then uh, we have a really nice lab. Um, personally, this is probably my favorite chapter of the book, if not one of my favorite chapters. Um, I really like teaching plate tectonics. I really like talking about plate tectonics. And um, the lab is actually one of the coolest labs that I think I, that I have. Um, to be fair, I, I took it from a, either a lab that I took in college or, or gave it at one of the other universities. So um, as long as no one checks up on me, uh, I'll continue to use this lab. But if somebody's like, hey, you're violating copyrights, uh, I'll, I'll probably have to find something else or change it in some unique way. But uh, it's a pretty cool lab. So uh, hopefully um, it'll be a little challenging, but hopefully when, when we get to it, y'all will enjoy it. Um, also, that reminds me, I guess I need to find a way to put it into Canvas uh, this week. Uh, I don't think it'll be too bad. It, it's mostly words and images with some some actual uh, analytical questions. So I think unlike the the river lab, which I, I hope everybody kind of saw that that would have been difficult to actually do inside Canvas um, with all the coloring and stuff. Uh, this one should be a lot a lot better suited for doing online. So uh, let's see. Where we're going to start off with with plate tectonics is uh, the precursor to plate tectonics, uh, which is continental drift. Um, continental drift was was hypothesized by a gentleman by the name of Alfred Wegener uh, in 1915. So this is this is quite a while ago, um, but maybe not as early as you might think. Um, you know, it, it, it took us a long time to kind of get to this point where we understood that the continents were moving. Uh, in a meaningful way. So um, world maps in the 1600s suggested that the South America and Africa fit together. Um, we've all kind of seen this um, when you look at a globe. In fact, now's the time for me to use my globe. So let me go and grab it. And uh, I think for, for a very long time, once we got 
uh, a fairly accurate, up-to-date map, which they're saying is about the 1600s. Um, every school child kind of sees that these two coastlines fit together. The western coast of Africa and the eastern coast of South America uh, really look like they would snap together kind of like a puzzle piece. Um, and, you know, it took, a, it took a while for scientists to be like, you know what, that, they're probably right. Um, those things probably do fit together, or at least the fact that they could fit together has to mean something. It's probably not just coincidence um, that those coastlines uh, fit together in a in a pretty uh, a pretty stark way. Um, so Alfred Wagner in 1915 outlined his hypothesis for the continental drift. Um, we I don't know that he knew about Pangaea at the time. Uh, in fact. I will I will look up in a second when when we first started to kind of think about Pangaea as a as a possibility. But um, there was a single supercontinent called Pangaea. I think uh, at some point in time uh, we will discuss the other supercontinents as well, um, Gondwana and Laurasia. Um, and so know that this is not a unique thing. Um, we've kind of had these cycles over and over again where um, the continents move apart and they come back together and, and form a supercontinent. Um, we're very far away from that right now, um, but the way that plate tectonics are, are headed today, um, if you fast forward this, um, we will eventually lead back into another supercontinent or at least two separate smaller supercontinents. Um, so yeah, Pangaea would have been um, together uh, roughly a little bit longer than 200 million years ago, um, and then it started to break apart. Um, and you get your smaller land masses that, that drift to their present positions, uh, which is the present day globe as we know it. Um, so uh, one of the things that led Alfred Wegener to, to get to this, high, uh, uh, this continental drift, drift hypothesis um, was several different things. First off, he started to see that there are fossils all over these different continents of animals that really had no ability to, or, or maybe a very limited ability um, to actually travel across those, those seas that separate those continents. Um, so for instance, you have um, this little guy, uh, C. Lystrosaurus, and he is in Antarctica. Um, you can find fossils of him in India and in Africa. Um, and if you look at him, it's probably not a great swimmer. Um, probably not a great swimmer. Um, India and, and Antarctica today have vastly different climates and temperatures, um, which usually isn't good for one species to, to live in those two different places. Um, same thing with Africa. Um, and so how could you find fossils of this, this one animal, um, which A, does not look like he has the ability to swim across an entire ocean, um, B, doesn't really look suited to live in vastly different climates like that. Um, how could he be there? Um, same thing with these plants here. You have uh, Glossopterus. Glossopterus? Yeah, I think I got that right. Um, and so this is a type of plant that you can find in Antarctica. You can find at the southern tip of South America um, and in Australia. Oh, also in India and Africa. So pretty much everywhere except for Europe. Um, this plant uh, fossil can be found. Same thing with Mesosaurus here. Um, and Mesosaurus is obviously a, a swimming dinosaur. Um, but when you look up Mesosaurus, Mesosaurus, as far as we understand from their fossils, um, is a freshwater dinosaur. Um, you don't find their fossils in, in saltwater deposits uh, out in the ocean. You find them in lakes on land. So these, this is more likely a freshwater dinosaur um, that would not be able to swim uh, across the ocean. Um, and I don't know if y'all covered this in biology. Uh, I, we might have covered it in geology, talking about different uh, freshwater versus saltwater animals. But um, you're, if you're designed to live in saltwater or freshwater, um, your cells literally cannot hold uh, the, the, they cannot handle the other type of water. Um, so like a freshwater animal, I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, so freshwater animal, if you spend a long time in salt water, 
the the how do I put this? There's a, a an imbalance in the purity of the water. Um, and so the water in your cells and in your body is going to want to rush out to try to balance out that saltiness of that water. Um, and it's the opposite. If you're a saltwater uh, animal and you go into a freshwater lake, your body naturally holds more salt in it, I believe, uh, than, than a freshwater animal. And so in order to try to balance that out, uh, your cells will let in more of that fresh water uh, to try to make that chemical balance the same. Um, and you will actually kind of swell up and your cells will actually burst, um, which is why in general, there's not very many animals that, that are able to do both. Um, you know, you either have freshwater fish or you have saltwater fish. Um, there's not a whole lot of animals that, that, live freely in both kind of scenarios. Uh, I guess one that I'm thinking of would be salmon. Um, salmon go out to sea and then they swim back up to mate. Um, but a lot of salmon, when they swim back up to mate, uh, they die, don't they? They don't just like swim up and mate in the rivers and then go back to the ocean. Uh, I think that's a one-way trip uh, for mating for, for a lot of them. So uh, I don't know. I need to brush up on my biology, but uh, know that this guy was a, a freshwater guy, and so the fact that he lives, uh, we found fossils in South America and in Africa, uh, would suggest, as you see from the map, that at some point in time, all of these continents were kind of connected, um, and that would provide a much easier path uh, for, for all of these animals to live in these different places uh, without having to cross the ocean. Now, this by itself um, is not necessarily con conclusive proof um, it's just a, a, a small piece of the puzzle. So uh, they talk about Mesosaurus and Glyptosaurus. Uh, Glossopterus is that seed fern. Um, opponents explain fossil patterns by saying the rafting, and rafting is a very real thing. Um, we've seen lizards uh, basically cling on to logs and branches um, during storms and move uh, very far distances from one island to another. Um, and then they start to populate that island. Um, oceanic land bridges, which of course humans use to travel from continent to continent um, before we were, we were boat builders. Um, and island stepping stones, which can kind of uh, make that trip a little bit easier to make. Um, when we get into, uh, actually it will be, it will be this one, um, plate tectonics, I believe. Um, maybe it's volcanoes when we talk about uh, we talk about uh, volcanics, but know that um, the Hawaiian island chain, where's Hawaii? It's way out in the middle of nowhere. There it is. Uh, the Hawaiian island chain, while it's small and kind of way out in the middle of nowhere, um, and only a few of them are up above sea level, um, there's a whole chain of mountains that stretches all the way from Hawaii, all the way over here, and then straight up to like Japan. Actually, that's not it. Yeah, that is it. I thought it went up towards Japan, but it actually goes up towards a uh, a part of the ocean uh, uh, of Russian Russia. Huh? There it goes. Maybe I'll have to look at that. I thought I swore there's a there's a thing up here that kind of shows it going towards Japan. Um, maybe it's just it looks like an island, and I assumed it was Japan. Um, sometimes I assume things and it gets me in trouble. Um, but so we talked about the fossils and how we see fossils on different continents. Um, the next thing that they kind of noticed was different rock types on different continents. Um, and so this is our present day map. Uh, you have the Appalachian Mountains in North America. Um, you also have this mountain range, which I don't know why they didn't bother to name the African mountain range. Um, but uh, I'm sure there's a name for it. I don't know why they put it up, didn't put it on the map. Uh, huh? Atlas Mountains? Uh, that's awesome. Uh, so this mountain range here on the, the west coast of Africa, um, you have mountain ranges at the top of the Scandinavian Peninsula, the British Isles, um, and then the Caledonian Mountains. I guess Caledonian is the one uh, in Scandinavia. Uh, and then a little bit up here in, uh, this would be Greenland. So if you push all the continents together the way we believe they were um, during Pangaea, you can see, 
Well, first, the first thing they saw was that all of these mountain ranges are roughly the same age um, and roughly the same uh, rock composition. Um, and the more that you look at them, the more you see that they're very, very similar. And so when you push the continents together and, and imagine Pangaea all together, um, these mountain ranges very much look like the same mountain range, like the same formation that formed at the same time. Um, and so this is another key part of plate tectonics. Um, so rock types and geologic features match up. Uh, about 2.2 billion year old igneous rocks in Brazil and Africa. Um, mountain belts end at the coastline and then reappear across oceans um, without really anything in between but they look very, very similar and they have very similar compositions. So uh, the next step, so we talked about fossils, we talked about mountain ranges. The next step is going to be glaciation. Um, you know, glaciers down here at the southern tip of South America aren't necessarily a huge deal. Um, they can get some pretty cold temperatures down here. Same thing with the southern tip of Africa. Um, South Africa does get snow um, from time to time. It's not unheard of. Um, but if you look at the glacial evidence, there's glacial evidence that uh, goes all the way up to the equator here. And glaciers at the equator is not something that, that really fits within our current definition of, of what can happen. Um, and then on top of that, oh, that's it. Well, that's okay. We've got plenty of time next week to go through this. Um, but remember, we're, we're going through the different steps of, of kind of what supports plate tectonics and uh, how we got to this point. So everybody have a nice weekend.